Would you like to work closer to home, save money on gas, and be rewarded for your hard work and attendance? Then Belicio Foods is looking for you. That's right, Belicio Foods is now hiring for multiple positions and shifts with great employee benefits, an on-site health clinic, competitive wages, and advancement opportunities. Belicio Foods is a company that truly values their employees. Apply online at Beliciofoods.com slash careers. The Jackson County Fair Board, in conjunction with Total Media, proudly present Neil McCoy. Neil McCoy. Saturday, July 15th at the Jackson County Fair. VIP track access seats now available for only 30 bucks, which includes admission to the fair. Get tickets now at jacksoncoohfair.com or at the Total Media Studios in Jackson. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the morning show right here on Main Street TV, where it is 7,052 degrees in this studio, so if we all pass out, you'll know why. Yeah. I downed a cup of coffee before I came in here, too. Oh, yeah. Real brilliant there. Yeah, I know. All right. So, it is... Okay, so we got a little mixed up this week. Our good friend Pete Wilson is on vacation. Jeremiah's a little under the weather. So James was our third string uh, contestant yesterday, and I guess you must be the fourth string because you know here you are. Phil Buffington is here to do the news. Yep. Do you feel good or bad about that? Uh, about being the fourth string. <laughs> good. I feel good about that. You're like I, I would be very happy to pass it over to yeah. <laughs> to Pete Wilson. No. Um, so we got mixed up a little bit. James and I did some blabbing yesterday about this, that, and the other, and. And uh, so Phil is here to fill us in. Phil's here to fill us in on lots of uh, news. And I mean, you know, over the weekend, there's always a ton of stuff that happens. So yeah. I'm sure that you have some good stuff. And he is our um, ace court reporter. So you always have some interesting things going on in the legal system as well. Yeah, there's a lot going on. There's actually, I think a trial starts today uh, that I should probably check up on later. But yeah, that never stops. So. <laughs> well, yes. Unfortunately, it does not. Nope. So, so what is going on? How have you been, Phil? We haven't seen you in a while. I'm pretty good. Pretty busy. How are those babies? Good. Sleeping at night. So that's really. Yeah. So what that means? Are you sleeping at yeah. night then? Yep. <gasps> that's For like a so month handy. now. Yeah. yeah. I'm only like seven or eight months behind now. So <laughs> he has like a year to catch up. Yeah. So, uh, how old are the twins? They will be four months old on May 8th. Wow. Yeah. Time flies, doesn't it? Does. It does, yeah. They're pushing crazy? like 15 pounds, too. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're getting big. They're e eating well, huh? Yeah, definitely. So do you find that the that the baby, like since they're twins, do you see any like weird twin stuff? Like do they feed off each other or like um, do they have any like twin spidey senses that you've noticed? Not really. And I mean, up until maybe like a week or two ago, they didn't really even acknowledge each other's existence. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. They don't look anything alike. They don't really act anything alike. Uh, but they're getting to the point now where if you lay them down facing each other, they'll talk to each other. Like they'll coo and oh, talk to each other. Oh, here we go. But that's like, that just happened like last week. So Aww, until then, it so was cute. you would like put them in each other's faces and they would look the other way. <laughs> like, so. I don't like you. You're taking my food. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're, they're doing pretty well. Do they have like completely different personalities? Absolutely. Yeah. Really? Yep. They don't look alike. They don't act like they're not the same size. Like there's, there's very little. <laughs> they have different color eyes. I think that they're going to have different colored eyes. Really? Yeah. So you won't really know they're twins, maybe? No, not 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 that I can tell. I mean, occasionally, if you look at them at the right angle, they'll look a little similar. But other than that, they look totally different. You just wonder as they grow and like how they as they develop um, whether they'll be you know, alike or start looking more alike or whatever? As of now, I don't I don't see hardly anything that looks alike with these two. Although I know several sets of identical twins that are nothing alike. Right, yeah. yeah. And you know, it's funny, like if you have, you've talked with people that 
are like, oh, yeah, those twins don't look anything alike. And if you don't know them personally, <laughs> you're like, no, they look exactly alike. But then if you actually have, like, friends that are twins or whatever, you, you're like, okay, I see what people are saying. They look not, They are not the same human being, yep. even though they share the same DNA. <laughs> yep. It's, like, funny how identical twins even can be so different. So. Oh, yeah. Well, that'll be fun to watch them develop and see how that all comes out. It's supposed to go back to the doctor soon and see how huge they are. Right now, our method is we weigh ourselves holding them. Yes. And then, you know, yeah, subtract. Kind of like at the vet's office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They're like little dogs. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, that's good. Well, keep us updated and uh, and because it's always fun to hear about the, the babies and how they're doing. So. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. So what the heck's going on in the news? We didn't get to talk about anything yesterday much. So although James and I filled each other, everybody in on the, the swap meet at Lucasville. Oh, okay. <laughs> James subjected his, his girlfriend to, <laughs> to that. And she's still with you? <laughs> <laughs> she's just mad I didn't let her buy a sheep. So sheep. they had yeah. all kind of like baby goats and lambs and chickens and whatever. And he said she wanted to take them all home. And he was like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds good if, up front, but then if, you get it home. If you are in the market for a peacock, that is the place to go. Yes. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And if you, <laughs> you are in the market for a goat with the perfect teats. <laughs> James experienced yeah, that I, as well. Did I tell that story on the show, or yes. did I just tell it to you? <laughs> yeah, because so, you said I'm so glad. I said if we weren't, if we, thank God we weren't together, and you said, yeah, you totally would have interviewed that lady about this yeah. goat's teeth. So like, ex- <laughs> yeah. well, we were talking to this very nice lady that knew everything there was to know about goats, and then another another uh, lady that was also way too into goats came up to her. And like, do you see that goat over there? It had great teeth. She's like, I saw those teeth. <laughs> I was like, ma'am, you need to get some friends that aren't like as into ghosts as you are. <laughs> yeah, broaden your horizons. Broaden your yeah, horizons like a you bit. You really need to yeah, make your world a little bigger, sisters. <laughs> anyway, so now you know there were goats with perfect teats up at the, at the Lucas <laughs> swap meet. I ain't afraid of no goats. <laughs> See? <laughs> All right, anyway, back to the news. Yeah. So well, you're sweating too, aren't you? It's hot in here. I do. So hot. <laughs> it's like 7,000 degrees. If only we knew a plumbing heating and cooling. If only we knew the, some people that had a heating and cooling company. Well, we can turn the air on, but then the people listening at home will just hear the air conditioning running. True, yeah. That's the problem. We're suffering for you. <laughs> That's the problem. We have to turn it off in here because it makes too much noise in the microphones. Uh. <sighs> Okay. Anywho. So back to the news. <laughs> uh, if well, we pass out, you'll know why. <laughs> this past weekend, uh, like Jen had said, it was pretty busy. We had uh, the Jackson County Fair uh, Queens Contest. Oh, that's right. Yes. That was held Saturday. And then we also had the uh, Wild Turkey Festival Queens Pageant and the uh, Little Miss Wild Turkey Festival Pageant. Uh, they were held Saturday and Sunday, respectively. Okay. Um. Now, with the Little Miss and with the Queens for the Wild Turkey Fest, uh, they whack, they won't be announced until um, May the 6th. So that that's still uh, under wraps. That'll be a surprise. Yes. Uh, so they have the pageant. They just... And then they put the winner in a safe and yep. don't yep. announce it until after the parade on Saturday. Right. Uh, but with, with the Jackson County Fair group, uh, they were announced... And they had their uh, their contest on Saturday, like I said. And the new 2023 Jackson County Fair this year is uh, Madeline Fannin. And uh, <clears throat> she's a junior at Jackson High School, and she's the president of the Four Mile Farmers 4-H Club. Uh, the first attendant this year is Jasmine Clarkson, a junior at the Buckeye Hills Career Center and a member of the Totally Awesome Kids 4-H Club. Okay. And the second attendant is Rebecca Shaw, and she's a junior at Oak Hill. And she's the president of the Hayseeds 4-H Club. Cool. Uh, they also have um, a number of younger attendants also. Uh, we have Natalie Allison of Oak Hill High School. She's the grades 9 and 10 attendant. Nevaeh Hightower, Jackson Middle School, is the grade 7 and 8 attendant. Abigail Cooper of Wellston Middle School is the grades 5 and 6 attendant. And Michaela Simpson of Christian Life Academy in Jackson is the grade 3 and 4 attendant. 
We also have a new Little Miss, and that is Adeline McMaster, and the new Little Mister is Kane Collier. (laughs) They're so cute. Yeah. Look how pretty everybody looks. And I'm pretty sure this was held at the... um, Park's Edge. Park's Edge, yeah. Yep. There's actually an event going on over there right now uh, for Jobs and Family Services, and Alex is over there taking pictures, and we'll have some coverage of that coming up, too. All right, so the Wild Turkey Festival Queens contest, like I said, was held, and their court selections are locked up safely in the vault at uh, Benton County National Bank until May the 6th. Uh, There were 11 contestants competing this year. We had Emma Leeming, Cassidy Graham, Bailey Wellman, Eliza Smith, Brooklyn Burns, Leela Hayslip, Cassie Peoples, Jaina Zimmerman, Lily Young, Allison Champion, and Gracie Peters. And they were all judged and scored in the event that took place on April 22nd. They also had the farewell speeches um, from the 2022 Queen and Court, uh, Lakin Williams, and her first runner-up, Ella Clancy, and second runner-up, Bailey Williams. Uh, there was musical entertainment. They have a talent contest. Uh, very, very neat program they had there. They also honored us, Total Media. Yeah. Uh, we're the Grand Marshals this year, the 2023 Wild Turkey Festival. So we had a dinner, um, a lengthy event. We had uh, Rodney Tomlin was there and spoke on behalf of the company and you know gave thanks and thanked the committee for selecting Total Media this year. Uh, spoke Y'all of, let Rodney talk? Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've seen Rodney everywhere. I went to uh, the Kids Fest in Athens a couple weekends ago, and I saw Rodney out there with the jambulance and stuff. And I'd, I'd never been to that before. That's a really neat uh, event that they have. Cool. You get to go in the field house next to Peden, where they have the uh, practice field for the okay. Bobcats. Oh, and they had awesome. a lot of booths set up and uh, vendors and games and stuff, all for the kids, Fun. like three bucks to get in, food, oh. had the burrito buggy set up. Oh, well, you can't go wrong with the burrito Heck buggy. Heck no. Let's see, yeah. I saw the <laughs> Jamie and I stopped by Jackie O's the other day. We had a meeting somewhere. We stopped there because we were early. And uh, <laughs> Jamie's like, there's that jambulance thing. And I was like, oh, God, <laughs> it's probably Rodney. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody look out. I'm glad to see that. I didn't see it go by, but he did. Yeah. I'm glad to see that we're, we're, in, uh, we're in Athens now. Yeah. Because obviously that's where I live, so it's it's neat to see that we're going to expand there. And um, we're working with the, the Athens Independent, you know, with some news sharing and stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. That's pretty exciting. It's a good, good market to open up in. And it wouldn't be a visit for me without talking about the Board of Elections. And this this thing continues, surprisingly. So James was telling me yesterday that there's a bit more controversy. And I'm like, I didn't know that there could be any more controversy. S- same. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> okay. I, didn't, I didn't ever expect it to go on this long, but um, it, it has. So, oh, my. Of course, they... <clears throat> this all... I mean, it's hard to remember even when it started. But most recently, of course, they had the impasse where they couldn't come to an agreement on the deputy director, the former deputy director, Marsha Beatty. And um, after, you know, five votes deadlocked at 2-2, yeah. that got sent to the Secretary of State. He sided with the Republicans. She was ousted from the office. So, so is she no longer there? No, she's no longer there. So there's, how can you run a board of elections with only a Republican? Because that's a huge deal. Yeah, and there's an election, you know, and just a there's an election coming few up. Days. Like, yeah, yeah. So that happened in early March. Um, so the process for the Democrats got started over again. So they convened their executive committee. They um, opened up for candidates to apply. They, I think, got four or five interested candidates. The party, as has always been the case, chose who they thought would be the best candidate. They ranked them according to their resumes, their experience, et cetera. Yeah. They, and this would be the Democratic... Um, executive Committee and Central it, Committee. Okay. And then they nominate... The way it's always gone and the way that it went for the person who's the director now, uh, Margaret Casey... Typically, what happens is if there's an opening, which it was weird in the past with this 
particular set of circumstances because of the trainee situation. They started out as clerks and then worked their way up into that position. Correct, because both Board of Elections directors retired at the same time. Right, and that's that's unusual. It's probably, un, yeah. But the way that it's been, and I mean, I, I wasn't all that aware of this. I'm painfully aware of it now. But as has always been the case, the respective parties choose their candidate. They put them forward. The other side of the fence just you know, agrees. And it's almost like a formality. It's not the law that they have to. But that's what norm typically happens. For, if you, can you know, however long, you know, a lot of these people have been involved for 40, 50 years. They say that's how, that's how it's always gone. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a customary thing where the other side just assumes that their counterparts did their due diligence in sure. choosing the right person. Okay. So that is not how it's gone lately. So after, you know, after Miss Beatty was removed, the Democrats got together. Like I said, they vetted their candidates. They picked who they wanted to put forward as the new deputy director. At a meeting earlier this month, it was um, said by the Republicans that they would like to interview all the people before they decide, which is not so far out of bounds away from, you know, the customary thing, but still isn't a direct, just a direct, okay, we'll assume that you have picked yeah. a good person. We'll respect who you pick. Right. Yeah, okay. So they were set to meet last Friday at 6.30. When they show up to the meeting, um, a lengthy comment was made, uh, a statement was made by Democratic board member Elaine Speakman um, laying out, some of the things I just talked about and how they don't want to go down this road where they're infighting still and um, accusing the other, accusing the Republican members of, I mean, it, it's a partisan group. It is no matter what, but sure. uh, more or less just having personal ill will toward the Democrats. So at the end of her statement, Elaine puts forth the person who they had selected already, which is uh, Roberto Willis Henry. It's Bobby Henry from Wellston. Okay. Um, and she, you know, she has experience as a poll worker. She's the one who they chose. And she votes yes. Rodney Smith, the chairman Democrat who's about to retire, he just recently announced his retirement. He votes yes. Kyda Newell and Debbie Kanner, the Republicans vote no. So it's tied again. Okay. So instead of the you know conversation continuing, they have to do that five times in a meeting. They have to vote five times before it's considered deadlocked. And uh, Mr. Smith, you know, packed up his stuff and they left into the meeting. So instead of you know, did they go through these in this, interviews that they said no, they were going to go through? No, Elaine. Um, Elaine, when she made her motion to put forth uh, Mrs. Henry. Uh, she said to forego the interview process because, like she had pointed out, there's no need to do that according to the customary act that is appointing somebody to a position on the Board of Elections. Okay. So um, I've got a 1,500-word story that I'm going to put in the paper tomorrow okay. that lays this all out. But <sighs> Were you there at the meeting? Yeah. And she pointed out, too... <laughs> that they they don't want to go down this road because once Mr. Smith retires, they have to do the reorganization yet again. So that means they have to vote on Margaret Casey again, who's the director. And it was almost like a veiled threat saying, uh, uh, if you yeah. want to do this, then we can do the same thing to you, and we'll just tie this whole thing up forever and ever. But the thing of it is, if if this continues on this way, it's been said multiple times, the Secretary of State reserves the right to come in and just clean house and get rid of everybody that's in there. Mm -hmm. But then the parties could turn around and appoint the same exact people who were already there because there's, there's no rule against them choosing somebody who was already there. So I don't know where this is going to go. I have no idea. I figured by now it would have been resolved. Wow. Um, this is, yeah, this is kind of unprecedented is the word, I guess that I, that comes to my mind just, because you just don't see it very often. No. And I mean, I, I haven't spoken to Miss Canner, but I have spoken to Kaida um, mm -hmm. about this several times, uh, more so prior to this. Um, but the, the Republican members right now maintain that Bobby Henry wasn't the highest scoring candidate. 
um, according to their criteria. Okay. But, you know, on the other side, conversely, Lisa Parker, who's the chair of the Democratic Party in the county, says that she absolutely was the highest scoring candidate. And the person that they are saying was higher scoring than Mrs. Henry was an individual who may consider themselves a Democrat, but has never registered as a Democrat. So... Well, that could be kind of problematic too, huh? Right. When they purge the voter rolls, if if you you know were a registered Republican, but yet you went in and voted straight ticket Democrat every time you voted, mm -hmm. and that voter uh, roll got purged, you're considered an independent if you didn't go and register specifically as a Democrat. Okay. So without that proof that you've registered with a certain party, they can't just assume that you're going to follow in with, you know, with the party. Gotcha. So though the Republicans say that this other individual was a higher scoring candidate, the Democrats maintain he's not really a Democrat. So we're going to go with the person that we think is best. Okay. And not only that, they're saying, why does it matter who's the highest scoring candidate according to your party when we are the ones who get to decide who our candidate is? Basically saying it has nothing to do with your party. This is our choice. Just go along with it like we've always done, like we did with the person who's in the director's chair right now. Gotcha. So I assume this is going to just continue on for a while and, until there's some sort of, you know, guidance or some sort of uh, mm. an agreement met. I don't, I don't know what to expect, but... You know, it's, if, if anything, it's kind of interesting just to see from a legal standpoint how all of this shakes out. Like, yeah. just because something's been done the same way forever doesn't make it right, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what is just because we've had a gentleman's agreement or whatever about how we've always done things doesn't make it necessarily right. Times can change. But what are the legal ramifications of this is kind of like where my brain goes next. And like there's been so many instances lately, I, I feel like in local politics where people have either resigned or passed away or, you know, have moved or whatever, where we've we've learned all of these you know, different kind of strange little laws mm -hmm. um, within the legal process about, you know, how does that unfold then if this situation happens? Yeah. And it's usually, I mean, the, the people that are directly involved in these extenuating circumstances don't necessarily know what to do either. Correct. Because it normally doesn't happen. So no. it's it's kind of a learning experience for all of us when when something strange happens and we get to see it all kind of work itself out. Yeah. And so now, I mean, this, th it would have been, it would have been hard regardless if they would have, you know, went along with Mrs. Henry's appointment. I mean, the, the primary is next week, you know, so. So how do you, back to my previous question, how do you run an election with one side, with only one side in I'm not really sure we've never had to elections. do it before. So is that even legal? Could it go back and say, you know, I mean, they still have, you know, Democratic representation in the amount of poll workers that they hire. It's it's split between the two parties. The only thing that's absent right now is the deputy director in that, you know, Democratic spot. So this election will have to just be run by uh, Margaret Casey and the board members and the poll workers that they have. But I thought you always had to have a Republican and a Democrat. Like, I didn't even think you could walk in the office You're without the other to. one. You're not supposed to. I mean, that's just how it's had to go. I don't know I don't know necessarily if Rodney, since he's the chair, will have to kind of assume some different responsibilities. Um, but hmm. as far as the process goes, I know that the, the Democrats, the, the Jackson County Democratic Party, they're going to meet the day after the primary on May 3rd. Uh, to choose a, a replacement for uh, Mr. Smith, who ha has announced his retirement. Um, so that individual will be chosen, and then the... Does that have to be approved by the Republican Party as well, or...? I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't... Oh, my. So, like I said earlier, once once that person is chosen, then they'll have to do the reorganization again for the entire board. They'll have to vote on the director. They'll have to, and there is no deputy director to vote on. I don't know if they'll try to vote on Mrs. Henry again or not. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns, but Oof. one thing is for sure, they're going to be, you know, one very important person down coming yeah. into an election. Um, and then coming, 
this fall, of course, we have the general election. Hopefully by then it will be rectified, but I don't really know. I would have thought it would have been rectified a long time ago. So Okay. Well it continues. The saga continues. <laughs> it sure does. Um I can see a Netflix documentary in our I've future. written enough about this yeah. From start <laughs> to finish. Probably like thirteen or fourteen articles I've written. Isn't that about crazy? It. Yeah, it is. But moving on. Hey, we're learning lots though. <laughs> yeah, along yeah, the I way. Know, I know a lot about about the legal, you know, legalities of elections. Yes. I have learned a whole lot about it. Yeah. This coming Friday, the Jackson Tree Commission uh, was recently brought back mm -hmm. uh, along with its Arbor Day program. So that's going to uh, take place on Friday at noon in Manpower Park. Uh, last year, the mayor, in celebration of the Apple Festival and the Apple Growing Heritage of the county, oversaw the planting of 12 apple trees on the west end of the park. Yes, yeah, so exciting. And those young trees uh, luckily survived their first winter. And that site has been chosen for the city's first organized Arbor Day program in uh, several years. Uh, while no new, no new trees will be planted in the mayor's orchard this year, the intent is for all future mayors to add to the orchard soon after they take office. Uh, the Arbor Day program in Jackson died on the vine when it was, that was Pete's play on words there. I like that. <laughs> when the previous Pun intended. Yeah, Jackson City Tree Commission uh, became inactive. And then in 2022, the Tree Commission was reactivated uh, thanks to the interest and commitment of citizens, uh, citizens Beverly Ondera, Bryn Stepp, and Crystal Finch. And they were appointed as members along with uh, city government representatives David Swackhammer and Harold Newkirk, Cruz, the second ward city councilman. Uh, local historian Bob Irvin is going to give a brief history on the past orchards of Jackson County, and Mark Wood will then portray the legendary Johnny Appleseed. And I think we have a picture of him there. Uh, the mayor will read a, an official proclamation declaring Arbor Day in Jackson. And this is one of the requirements of becoming a Tree City USA, a title Jackson achieved for many years before the former Tree Commission uh, went belly up. So... It's good to see that coming back. It is, you know, it's um I don't those are just little things that make a town special. Yeah. You know, like there's going to be people that come and see those apple trees in the park and be like, wow, that is so cool. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, there's apples in Jackson. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like cool. Because unfortunately a lot of our orchards have have kind of, you know, gone by the wayside and yeah, we don't have any anymore, do we? I Richards don't... Brothers, I think I closed think up. Yeah. So I think that we're kind of Hmm. you know, defunct of, of you know, or local orchards. And uh, so it's just nice to see something like that. I mean, I have an apple tree at my house, so I'm doing my part. Yeah, yeah. I know people that have apple trees, and, I mean, it sounds like Dude. it's fun. But there's so many apples that come off of an apple tree, it's insane. Let me tell you, Jamie and I got this dwarf apple tree, like, <laughs> years ago. We first, we just, you know, planted it as a as a lark kind yeah. of thing. And it didn't do anything forever. And so then we sp started planting, you know, a few different trees on our property. And I don't know what tree we planted that made it happy. <laughs> <laughs> but the next thing we know, this thing is like, so about every other year, like last year we had zero apples. This year you can't see the tree for all the blooms on oh, it. Yeah. I should have taken a picture and brought it in. Yeah. I mean, it is like insane so but we have so much fun for, with this tree because we have tons of deer where we live and so the deer and it'll be the same thing in the park i'm sure oh yeah so we just have this like you know standing agreement with the deer that they can have the bottom half of the apples and we get to keep the top half of the apples and um so the year before last we brewed a really cool like apple cinnamon beer at the brewery with all the oh. jamie and i peeled all the apples and we used it for a beer at the brewery and it was really good. Um, Do you but, yeah. use the peels or the actual apple? No, we peel peel it and use the apple, okay, the okay. actual apple. So we peeled all the apples and then, you know, cut them up, cooked them down, um, and then put them in the beer. Okay. Because it has to be sterilized. Like gotcha. what you're putting in the beer has to be sterilized. Um, but yeah, the deer will come and the, I've told this story a hundred times, but the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life, and I could not get a picture of it 
was this mom was there and she had all these little babies around mm. the bottom of the tree and she was standing up on her hind legs and she was picking apples and she would drop them on the ground so that they could <laughs> eat them. And it was the cutest thing I've ever seen, but you can go out there and there's like apples. It looks like humans took bites out of them. It's hilarious. And they just take bites out of them and then they'll like leave them. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, so. I hope that these, that the tree commissions too. Like, I know in Wellston, there's a lot of these, um, I think they're pear trees, maybe. Maybe. The, the ones that are, like, invasive, and they're not oh, supposed yeah, to be the, planted anymore. Yeah. The Cleveland pear, Bradford yeah. pears. Yeah. They find they, they find their way, like, close to the edge of the roadside, and that's where they grow. And they block out the sun from, like, the native trees, and they kill them off. Yeah. And they tear up. The roots get too big, and they tear up the sidewalks. Yes. Um, so I hope that they, you know, pay attention to stuff like that. Maybe try to get rid of some of these non-native right. species of trees. Which is what happened in this, in downtown Jackson. Right. Those yeah, were all Cleveland pear trees. Mm-hmm. And um, they ended up having to remove them all because they just got yeah. big, tore up the sidewalks, all that stuff. So I don't know. That's That's always, I know that was something that they were working on here in downtown Jackson, whether or not to replace you know, the trees with something different or just to let, you know, put planters there instead. I know they were asking kind of like for suggestions on that. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. I mean, the trees look beautiful lining the streets, but when they take over, it's, you know, not okay. Yeah. And And then it's very costly to replace sidewalks and cut them down and remove stumps and all that. too. Definitely. And I I mean, it's good to have a group of people that are in the know about stuff like that. Yeah, Because the absolutely. average person wouldn't know until it's probably too late and it's damaged something in your yard, maybe. For sure. But, uh, yeah, those trees, you can't even legally buy them anymore, no. I don't think. Mm-mm. So it's like prohibition. Maybe we can become <laughs> underground pear Cleveland pear tree farmers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got the goods. <laughs> But uh, no, I think that's wonderful. Love the Arbor Day thing and love that they're, you know, brought back the tree commission because it's just, those are the little things that make towns so special. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, In Wellston, um, we still have, I mean, technically we have a vacant um, service director position, though Mm -hmm. the city utility director, Jeff Bates, has been filling in in the interim. Uh Uh-huh. But according to uh, the mayor, Anthony Brenner, uh, the the new service director, the permanent service director, is expected to be starting on May eighth. Uh, still not sure who this individual is, but um, so they haven't been announced, but they're going to start working. Right. Yep. Okay. So this is a. I don't know if the person had to move. Uh, Mayor Brenner had mentioned this probably two meetings ago, so about a month ago he had mentioned this first. Um, and said that he had a, can- a, a really good candidate lined up. So does just he hire the yeah. service director, or yeah. is that a council yeah. the, thing? The mayor gets to hire service director. Oh, so he yep. has the final say in it. Okay. Yep. yep. Gotcha. It was, And, of course, it was difficult at first to find someone to take that job because of the, six, the, the situation with the primary coming up. Because uh, yes. you know, Anthony's running against Tom Clark yes. in the primary, and you know whether or not he wins will determine if that service director gets to continue on. So it could be a very short lived <laughs> Yeah, it could be like time. a few days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, that was kind of the issue there, trying to find somebody to take that job. Okay. C- considering you know the uncertainty of it all, um, so well, there's some nervous people at the city building in Wilson right now because you know. A new mayor could come in, and anyone who's not in the union could be subject to termination. Uh, the new mayor reserves the right to surround himself with the staff yeah. of his choice or her choice. So what have you heard? Do you know any dirt? Do you know the tea? I don't. I don't. Phil! I've seen, I've seen a lot of signs uh, both ways. I know they've both, uh, Brenner and Clark, have been making their way around town, talking to people door to door, handing out pens, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it'll be interesting. I know uh, Tom is a well known person. He was on council for over three decades. Long time, yeah. Yeah. So people are used to seeing his name. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he's always been around Wellston. He still uh, is a tow truck driver there in town. So okay. he has a lot of friends. Now, Anthony's from Wellston. Uh, he and his family moved away for quite a while because he was in the military. Yep. So he hasn't been as visible uh, up until here when he started as uh, former mayor Charlie Hudson's service director and mm-hmm. was on council before that for a little while. Mm-hmm. 
So it'll be interesting to see. Okay. Um, but during the, other than that announcement, during the last city council meeting last Thursday, uh, Mayor Brenner gave some updates uh, regarding some upcoming potential projects and some projects that are, you know, ongoing right now. But uh, one of the more fresh things that he brought up was the fact that the city of Wellston was approved recently through OVRDC for a traffic study, and it would be for the south end of town for Pennsylvania Avenue from uh, 14th Street to 10th Street. Um, it's a twenty thousand dollars study that they got approved for. Will cost you know the city no money. Of the RDC will will mm-hmm. cover the cost of that, but can that could eventually turn into like a two million dollar plus street widening project? Because on that end of town, they have Montgomery Trucking uh, that's going to expand. Okay. They have the Destiny Trucking uh, Trucking the School trucking there. School, yeah. They've got a lot of classes going on. Um, They've got the AEP building right there, right next to Montgomery Trucking. So there's a lot of traffic. And, and a lot of big vehicles. Absolutely. Going there, through there. Just last year alone, there were 52, I think, accidents, 52 or 54 accidents there. Non-fatal, of course, because you're going slow. But that had a lot to do with those wide turns from the semis. I could see that. And then you have, you know, traffic going into the fairgrounds during yeah. the fair. And yeah. you have all of this, and it's all bottlenecked right there at that that intersection. Yep. And so their hope is that, you know, if they do this traffic study and it's determined that it's a necessity, that they'll be able to widen that long stretch of road that would basically go from down around Dairy Queen and that intersection Mm -hmm. all the way to 14th Street as you're exiting Wellston going toward General Mills. The great thing about Wellston is they have really wide streets down through there anyway. So it seems as if there would be room to... Not even have to knock out sidewalks and things like that. And it, it might be, you know, it's probably one of those situations where they would close one lane and, you know, I don't know how that would work. But luckily with Wellston too, there are so many ways to get across town. Yeah. It's, it's kind of set up here. To, it's yeah, like a grid. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is great. Absolutely. So there's a there's a chance that that could, you know, blossom into okay. a, an, an expansion project there. Which is a good indication that the city is growing. And, yeah. Yeah. That's good news. And then further south of town, uh, past Berlin Crossroads, across the street from Splashdown, mm-hmm. a Chillicothe-based company called Frontier Community Services is in the process. They just got the plat approved, the plat adjustments approved to the commissioners. Uh, they've gotten a lift station fixed down that way. Wellston has agreed to unabandon that stretch of sewer line down yeah. through there, and they're hoping to start this summer on construction for a 46 unit uh, senior housing development. Mm-hmm. So they've got the tax credits lined up there. Um, that'll be at least for 30 years, it would be a, a senior housing development. And then there's plans for a second phase of that, which would be an additional 40 units. Much needed. Much, much needed. So it's not high end, not low end. It's moderate housing. It'll be based on... But they're individual homes, right? Is that the way I understood it? I think that they... I'm not sure that they are connected or not connected, but I know that they all have... They're all two-bedroom units, and they all have attached garages. Mm -hmm. And then they'll have, like, a community building that they share, a fitness facility, a dog park, things like that. Love that. And it's... I I don't know I want to go live there. Right. (laughs) Yeah. They they look really nice. And I've seen some of the other projects that this FCS company has, and they're all really, really nice places. They they take good care of them. But it's in, I'm sure you've seen it. As you go down uh, 327 south of Wellston, you'll come to splash down on your right. Mm -hmm. But then over in the left, it's just a flat, empty field. But there's a road. It's called Wheatland Drive. It goes out down and then reconnects down the road on 327. Okay. That that property has sat there since 2008 just vacant. I think it was meant to be a housing development, but then something fell through. Sure. The city abandoned sewer lines, you know, it didn't look like anything was going to come of it. Jeremy Eisenhagel bought it 2 years ago and started the process of, you know, removing some of the restrictions from the plat and uh, he got with FCS, and then they've they've had this ball rolling for some time. Mm-hmm. But it looks like everything's in line for that to to, to take shape. Um, aside from that, this, the city has also been working on some updates to their traffic light systems uh, down okay. through town. 
So they've been installing pressure sensors on all the side streets that connect to Pennsylvania Avenue. They've installed uh, new camera systems on the lights and uh, buttons for pedestrians. So once this is all active, it should be active this week, the new traffic light system will be so that if you, for instance, go down Pennsylvania Avenue at 2, at 2 in the morning when traffic's light, every one of those green lights or every one of those lights down Pennsylvania will be green. Okay. So you'll just be able to go right down through town. Head on down through there. And the only time they'll change is when somebody either pushes the button as a pedestrian or pulls up to a side street, that pressure sensor will tell the light to change. Okay. So it should really f clear up traffic quite a bit. Good. Okay. Um, that's been ongoing for quite some time, too. When they, If they work. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. That's that's the goal. That's the, I, I know the bane of some people's existence that have to monitor those things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they don't work, but. There's a, there, there are a lot of projects going on in Wellston right now. That's cool. The, the. Kelly Lambert Park should mm -hmm. be about done. Uh, I think it's expected to be done this week. I'm excited to see that when it's all finished. Right. It's going to be such a great asset to the community. Yeah, and I mean, even when they had the old playground equipment there, I mean, it was still a place to go. It was still a park for kids to play on. Well, it was it's easily just maybe accessible. Not so safe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really good spot. That's so that's that's maybe not so safe. <laughs> <laughs> Those slides, yeah, they were the old metal, like 90 foot tall slides. As you come home with no skin on the back, it, back yeah. side of your legs, but third yeah. degree burns, yeah. Hey, we've all been there. That's a rite of passage, dang it. And Parker got to experience it, so he, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's one of the last groups to go down one of those painful, painful slides. <laughs> it's 95 degrees, yeah. <laughs> let's go down the slide as your skin boils all the way down, yeah. Um, so aside from, from those projects, uh, I know that they've got the McNally pit building that they're still, uh, trying to figure out what to do with. They okay. got the $750,000, uh, Brownfield remediation funds for that building. The city's kind of in a spot where they're deciding whether or not they want to try to sell the building, keep it, use it as a city garage, et cetera. But they do have some state funding coming to help with whatever decision they do make. Okay. Um, they've got a lot of projects coming up with the recently created infrastructure crew that they made of their own employees where it allows them to do some of these bigger projects like water line replacements, um, sanitary and uh, storm sewer separation projects that are upcoming. Um, Jeff Bates mentioned that he's the, like I said, the active acting service director right now, whenever some of the projects they have upcoming, um, they're going to create or they hope to create a municipal parking lot in downtown Wellston, which is also much needed. Yeah. But what got that conversation started is the fact that the city has exist existing legislation that says, I don't know if anyone, I mean, I'm sure some know, but a lot of those businesses in downtown Wellston have apartments above them. Okay. So it might look like it's a, you know, a couple people that show up to run a business in a day, but four or five people live up on top. Gotcha. And each one of those apartment units are due to off-street parking spots. Now, there are no off-street parking spots. Right. So they're getting ready to do a project to widen Ohio Avenue right there all the way down to the old Kroger building and all the way up to the 2nd Street intersection. Okay. They're going to, you know, fix the sidewalks, uh, fix the angle of the parking spots. But then right there at the corner of Broadway in South Ohio where the old post office cafe was, mm -hmm. uh, where the art club for Wilson High School just painted mm -hmm. that mural and all. Uh, right next to ERA Martin and Associates, there's that blank slate that they're going to use, and they're going to put in a parking lot there. And then they're also thinking about putting in, possibly at the old Kuppenheimer lot, put in some parking so that uh, they can get these people what they've actually been due all along um, and get some off-street parking. And then they're considering cool. enforcement also, you know, and put a, they'll give them parking placards so that so someone who actually lives there is given a reserved parking spot. They'll have to pay a nominal fee, you know, for a month or a year, however. And then if you're caught parking there uh, without that placard, you'll be towed and impounded. Okay. So that's, that's upcoming also. Um, this past weekend, the police department held a civil service exam. I think they had two individuals come to test, so we'll be hearing about the results of that here soon. Okay. Uh, they'll hopefully get that vacancy filled. Um, you know, people don't know that. Like, police officers have to take tests yeah. to, and, and to move up and all that stuff. Like, there's 
a lot to it. Yeah, you have to take the test to get hired initially, and then if you want to move up and you know to be a sergeant, you have to take a test. If Correct. you want to be the chief, you have to take a test. So yep. yeah. Um, um, we just got uh, some photos from Jeremiah Shaver of Kelly Lambert Park. Oh, nice. Oh, is that them working on it? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Wow. I hadn't been down by there. Oh, I bet that's is that going to be swings? Looks like. Looks like it. And this this park oh, too, I, I, I knew uh, they got a I think seventy five thousand dollar ODNR Nature Works grant uh, that Mindy Eisenagel was able to secure for the city. Uh, so this has been a long time coming, and uh, some of the equipment that they're installing too is ADA. Uh, yeah, love friendly. that. Yeah, that's awesome. It's all inclusive. All inclusive. Tons of drinks and dinner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really good. So I think that they are building a new shelter house also, and they're putting in some new benches and uh, fencing around the site, which they had a fence, but it was like a picket fence that a Thanks, kid could Jeremiah. easily walk through. So <clears throat> they're getting that to shape up. Speaking of Jeremiah, he just recently wrote an article about uh, some law enforcement related things. Um, this one involves two women that got into a fight um, one of which, one of whom was actually recently indicted. So this this all happened in mid March. There was a fight between two women in Glenroy. It escalated to the point that one of the women ended up in the hospital, and the other, this Samantha Simpson, she's 36 of Wellston. She was indicted by the grand jury in uh, <clears throat> early earlier this month, and was indicted on one count of felonious assault, which is the second degree felony. Um, the incident report states that Simpson knowingly caused serious physical harm to uh, Jennifer Spradlin, 36, also of Wellston. Um, the, the police report says Spradlin uh, reportedly suffered a bloody nose and had one eye swollen shut and was taken to the ER. And then Spradlin later told the telegram that she had to be flown by helicopter to Grant Medical Center in Columbus because she suffered an uh, orbital fracture which is your orbital bone is the bone that surrounds your eyeball. Mm. So, Oh, that sounds horrible. Terrible, yeah. So uh, Simpson was indicted and is scheduled to appear before the uh, Common Police Court in early May, May 11th. Okay. Um, this is a follow-up from something that happened last fall. Um, we had an incident where an Oak Hill bus driver ran off the side of the road out on CH and D. Mm-hmm. Okay. It mm -hmm. was an elderly woman uh, named Ruth Hoyt. Nobody was on the bus. Nobody was hurt. You know, I think the charges were dismissed in municipal court for failure to control or mm -hmm. whatever. But then um, later that same month, uh, Miss Hoyt was driving down Main Street here, right mm -hmm. in front of our office. Right in front of our office, yes. And happened to go up onto the sidewalk hit an individual, and then kept going. Um, I've heard, and I don't have anything in any police reports to, to cite with this, but I have heard, um, because, you know, we all know each other here in Jackson County. That, Not that you read it on <laughs> Facebook. You heard it. It's different. But she, I think, had like a medical problem. Yes, I don't think it was. That's what that sounds like. Right. I think she blacked out and... When she went, she, uh, from what I gathered, went down the road and went to um, one of the pharmacies and was just shopping like nothing had happened until the police, I mean, they found her bumper and license plate on the sidewalk, so they yeah. knew who it was. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't think that she did this maliciously by any stretch. Uh, she doesn't have a criminal record or anything like that. Okay. But she's nonetheless been indicted um, on leaving the scene of an accident, which is a fifth degree felony. So uh, she was wow. issued a summons. She's not under arrest, anything like that. Um, they reserve the right to put certain people who are indicted in, in jail and hold them there until their trial date or until their arraignment or mm -hmm. whatever. In this instance, it was just a summons was given. So she was given her papers and yeah. she's at home. I don't think... Show up at, at court. Right. So we'll see how that plays out. But The individual that was struck, um, I never Katrina heard... Katrina Lawhead, Lee Master. So. Is she okay or I, I believe so. I mean at the shortly after the fact she she was airlifted to St. Mary's um and she had serious injuries but oh. 
I believe she recovered. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's hope so. It, it she must have been hit pretty hard. But yeah, she went up onto the side. She was in a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and it just ran up onto the sidewalk. It ran over a sign. It hit Miss Lawhead Lee Master, and continued on down the road. So hmm. we'll see how that all shakes out. Uh, some upcoming events for this weekend. Um, Saturday, April 29, Vinton County High School's Prom Walk, which is uh, dubbed this year as Wander into Wonderland, will be held beginning at 6 p.m. Uh, we have class officers uh, M. Kane, B. Burns, E. Davidson, E. Mayers, R. Nichol- McNichols, L. Williams, B. Williams, E. Graham, M. Montgomery, and A. Allman, and the class advisors uh, will have a dinner that take place directly after the Prom Walk. And dancing is from 7.30 to 10 p.m. And an open house will be observed from 4 to 5 for anyone wanting to see the decorations. Uh, there will also be a hazardous materials functional exercise to be conducted this Sunday, April 30th, uh, through the Jackson County Local Emergency Planning Committee. And that will involve uh, numerous local uh, emergency response teams, Wellston Fire Department, the Hazmat Team, uh, 911 Dispatch, Wellston PD, the Sheriff's Office, Jackson County EMS, the Health Department, Holzer Medical Center, etc. So uh, it will mainly involve outdoor activities, and residents will not see first rep- responder vehicles traveling for the exercise, nor will any roadways be affected. Um, there will be some amateur ham radio communications conducted over the multiple counties throughout the exercise and other first responder traffic via regular first responder communication systems. Okay. Uh, they do these every so often. They like to get the word out ahead of time in case you see this and think that there's <laughs> something there's terrible something. happening. Yeah. <laughs> but there's not. This is just a training exercise. Dylan, is your prom this weekend or is it next weekend? Uh, yeah, it's this Saturday. This Saturday okay. also. Jackson prom too. We are in that season. Yes. Somehow. Tis the season. Uh, this Saturday too is the first of three uh, rabies clinics that are put on through the Jackson County Health Department. Mm. Uh, the commissioner's... Uh, conti- they uh, express their support for this continuing uh, program that the health department does. And Health Commissioner Aston was present to discuss that. Uh, this has a lot to do with the participation of local veterinarians. So it, it does. It all depends on how willing they are to do this. Um, he says that this is split, the cost of this is split between the county commissioners and the health department Mm -hmm. and it usually only costs about two dollars per dose of Mm -hmm. the vaccine administered but this year the first one is saturday april 29 from 11 a.m to 1 p.m at the fairgrounds jackson county fairgrounds with uh, dr anderson okay Uh, the second won't be until saturday may 20th from 11 to 2 at the madison jefferson fire department with dr parker and then saturday june 3rd from 10 a.m to 2 p.m at the jackson city of the fire fire department with Dr. Kidd. So, okay. And I think they, I don't know that they donate their time, but I feel like they do. Cause a lot of them would have office hours on like a Saturday. So, right. Um, it's, it's not totally, it's not totally free, but it's very, very low cost considering what it would cost if you went to do this on your own. Uh, yeah. Pay maybe, for vet, for the office visit yeah. and all of this stuff. Plus if you don't, if, if at least get, your animal a rabies vaccine. Right. Because you never, ever know. And I think you have to do that happen. every three or five years, I think. It depends on what, like, I think species it is. I think dogs are every two years. Okay. Every other year. But those that are planning to go uh, this year, they're being asked to pay a little bit more than in the past. Uh, I think before it was 2 or $3. Now they're being asked to pay 5 uh, and that's for each vaccine, to, and that's to help cover the cost of the local veterinarians and their yep. and their staff. Um, and they're also anyone planning to attend also is asked to keep their dogs on leashes and their mm-hmm. cats in carriers and to keep, <laughs> yeah. keep distance from other pet <laughs> that owners. That could turn out real interesting. <laughs> yeah. And as uh, Health Commissioner Aston pointed out, there, this isn't done to make any sort of a profit. Um, all the local vets. Uh, do a great job with the animals and it's a super f- efficient way to not only protect your pets, but to decrease the overall chances of anyone in the yeah. community contracting rabies. You know, a lot of people don't know this, <clears throat> but for example, if, you know, even if you would be bit bitten by a dog or cat or, or whatever, and they have not been vaccinated, 
you got to worry about that. Yeah. And um, those shots aren't fun either. They get, yeah. Correct. So it's like, there's a, just spend the five bucks, get your animal vaccinated and then nobody has to worry about anything. Yes. Like it's a fairly simple thing. Like, Indeed. Mm -hmm. Along with a whole lot of other things that I don't understand why people don't do them, but that's a whole other story. And I'm, I'm waiting. I, I don't know if Pete has mentioned this or not in the past, but the situation that took place in Benton County with uh, the murder trial, the double murder trial with Christopher Schutz. Okay. So that, that trial wrapped up the f day that it started. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that rings a bell or not, but he <clears throat> was facing... Some That's the one where it was the he and the girlfriend. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we're still awaiting um, his actual sentencing, but that should be upcoming. And then we have to see how the girlfriend's sentencing plays out because she had struck a deal with the state prior to Christopher Schutz's trial starting because she had agreed to testify against him. Okay. Considering the fact that she never got the opportunity to testify against him, I don't know how that affects her deal. Gotcha. A lot of people were worried that she's going to end up getting more time than he did or is expected to get because he's only looking, I, I think, um, 22 years in prison okay. for murdering two people. So a lot of unhappy comments coming our way following that oh. trial and accusations of mishandling of the process, you know. Interesting. Family members of the victims especially are very upset. Um so we haven't forgotten about that. I just wanted to mention it because it has been a, f a few weeks since mm -hmm. that's happened. But we're, we're more or less waiting to see what happens with the sentencings uh, before we can start asking some serious questions to the prosecutor's office and Jim Payne um, to see what happened. Because they got all the way to the point where the jury had been seated. They had opening statements. The jury was asked to leave. Uh, one of the jury members actually works here, uh, surprisingly, Joel Walton. Or, oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know he that. He was on the jury. Uh, so they were asked to break. I was there. I covered the opening statements. I, I went home to type up what had happened, and then I get a text later that afternoon that says that they had reached an agreement. So oh, okay. They offered up a plea deal after op okay. opening statement or whatever. So. He ended up pleading guilty to uh, two counts of voluntary manslaughter and is looking at between, I think, 22 and 25 years in prison, which sounds like a lot. But I think the majority of people assumed that he would be facing life in prison. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, if it would have happened in a county that wouldn't be bankrupted as a result of this, it would have probably been a capital case. Yep. But we all know what happened the last time Vinton County tried a capital murder case they, they went bankrupt. So, unfortunately, that has a lot to do with the yeah. penalties that you could face. Isn't that crazy? It absolutely is. And mm. according to what I heard in these opening statements, uh, it was brutal. It wasn't just a crime. It wasn't a crime of passion like he, you know, showed up, got mad, shot somebody. He shot these people. He shot the one individual so many times he ran out of ammo, then went back to his truck to get more and then shot him two more times on the way back through, even though he had already been dead. And then tracked oh. down the one. There was a 911 call of the woman victim pleading for her life. And uh, it was oh terrible. Oh, my gosh. So this guy's going to get 22 years in prison for that. I understand why the family members of these victims are upset. It definitely seems like something didn't go the way it should have gone. Uh, so we wow. will follow up with that and oh, ask my. the uncomfortable question of you know, who dropped the ball. But I'm just as interested as they are, and we'll we'll find out what happened. Okay. Um, if I if I'm <laughs> if I'm able to be told, then I'll I'll tell you too. But that's ongoing. Uh, I would expect it would be sometime soon. Okay. But yeah. Interesting. There's I think there's an actually another murder trial in Benton County about to start too. Totally separate of this. So. My goodness. Yeah. Interesting times. Um. It is. There's a trial starting today um, of the individual here in Jackson that had um, been charged with multiple counts of pandering obscenity and I think even rape involving juveniles. <laughs> Which a, one? Robert Nickel, the one that was his own children. Because there's like, you know, 20 of them so, right now. So, so many. 
Yeah, and this one, okay. I've yet to determine whether or not these were his biological children, but there were eight children living in that home, all minors, all with his last name. So either they adopted these children or they are their own biological children that he was accused of molesting slash raping. And as soon as his indictment was filed, his wife filed for divorce. Um, so she was obviously unaware of what was going on. So... The, and like Jen said, that's just one of many. Yeah. And not even the only one that involves someone's own family yeah. either. There's several. Yeah. So. Not that any of it makes it any better, but. No, and I, I would be interested to know why all of a sudden this is such a I think I know, thing. but. Yeah. You know, opinions are like belly buttons. Yeah. And other things. <laughs> What are the th- What do you mean? I don't know. I'll tell you off the show. <laughs> That's for one of those off the air uh, conversations, okay. Phil. <laughs> no, thank you so much for spending your morning with us, filling us in on what's going on. Because man, there is a lot. Uh, you know, we live in a small community, but doesn't mean that there's not a lot of news going on. And, All the time. Um, some good, some bad. Um, what is your prom theme, Dylan? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I forget. <laughs> the after party is casino. I know that. Cool. that was mine. Yeah, nice. Nice. Teaching minors to gamble. <laughs> yeah, right. It's exactly. legal now. Hey, there you go. Just starting them early. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> no, that'll be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, prom is just a rite of passage. It, it's just it's something that you'll remember forever. I do remember last year's was gold. Gold? Yeah. Just gold. You guys, <laughs> keeping it simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this year's bronze. Okay, well, uh, platinum. Maybe we're moving up in the world. All right, well, have a great day, everyone. We appreciate you so much for watching. <laughs> Thank you, Phil, for spending your morning with us. I know you're very, very busy. And um, so we'll see you right back here tomorrow on Wednesday. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs> This just in. The Telegram News has a new website. TheTelegramNews.com. Same dedicated coverage. Same trustworthy news with a brand new look. Covering Jackson and Benton County and surrounding areas. Locally owned and operated, TheTelegramNews.com has its finger on the pulse of the community. Stay up to date on local events, high school sports, and breaking news. TheTelegramNews.com. Subscribe today at TheTelegramNews.com. Check it out.